Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, presents Good News Today, featuring an inspiring gospel teaching by Father Jim Willing. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. And Jesus said to his apostles, Behold, the hand of the one who is to betray me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man indeed goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to debate among themselves who among them would do such a deed. And Jesus said, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed that your own faith may not fail. And once you have turned back, you must strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am prepared to go to prison and to die with you. But Jesus replied, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows this day, you will deny three times that you know me. Then going out, he went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not undergo the test. After withdrawing about a stone's throw from them and kneeling, he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still, not my will but yours be done. And to strengthen him, an angel from heaven appeared to him. He was in such agony, and he prayed so fervently that his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. When he rose from prayer and returned to his disciples, he found them sleeping from grief. He said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not undergo the test. While he was still speaking, a crowd approached, and in front was one of the twelve, a man named Judas. He went up to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? His disciples realized what was about to happen, and they asked, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said in reply, Stop! No more of this. And he touched the servant's ear and healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and temple guards and elders who had come for him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? Day after day I was with you in the temple area, and you did not seize me. But this is your hour, the time for the power of darkness. After arresting him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter was following at a distance. They lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. And Peter sat down with them. When a maid saw him seated in the light, she looked intently at him and said, Ah, this man too was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I, I, I do not know him. 
A short while later, someone else saw him and said, You too are one of them! But Peter answered, My, my friend, I am not! About an hour later, still another insisted, Assuredly, this man too was with him, for he also is a Galilean. But Peter said, My friend, I do not know what you are talking about. Just as he was saying this, the cock crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord how he had said to him, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. He went out and began to weep bitterly. The Gospel of the Lord. This passion narrative was probably the part of the gospel that was most proclaimed by the early apostles following Jesus' resurrection. So as we look at this today, we're looking at the core of our faith, together with next week's reading on the resurrection of Christ. It seems to be a more manageable way of presenting this is to divide it into three of the scenes of the passion that I pick because each of them have the beautiful character of Peter in each of them that we can so quickly, easily identify with. And I would begin with the Last Supper scene. As you would recall, it was there and then that Jesus said to his disciples, this night all of you will have your faith shaken and you will abandon me. Peter, as we know him to be, boast, Lord, though all would have their faith shaken in you, mine will never be shaken. Don't you love Peter? It sounds just like you and me, huh? It sounds just like all of us on Sunday as we profess our creed in God, as we say, yes, Lord, take me, use me through this week. Yes, Lord, I'm with you. I give my whole life to you. Yes, Lord. Then Monday morning happens and we go to work And without realizing it, we're falling so short of what we prayed and professed so strongly on Sunday. What we see here, and what I like to suggest, is that Peter is in denial from the very beginning, denying this part of himself. He's denying his own weakness and sinfulness. This sense of pride that filled Peter with an inflated view of himself did not help him see that part of himself that Carl Jung speaks of in later about the psychological term, shadow self, the darker side of our personality. All of us have that part of our heart that's not completely given over to the Lord, that part of our personality that's not totally redeemed by his love and mercy. And Peter was not in touch with that, so he was in denial. But Jesus, who saw through it, said, Peter, I give you my word. Before the cock crows tonight, you will deny me three times. Peter can't hear it. He says, Lord, though I would have to die for you, I will never disown you. Wow. You know, Jesus is saying, Peter, get real. And Peter is caught up in the ideal. Wow, can I relate to that? Let me speak about this cock crow that is such a beautiful symbol in this gospel. First, you might know in ancient times, a rooster's crow was the first thing you would hear in rising in the morning. The cock crow was a sign of the end of night and the beginning of a new day. So on One level, Jesus was simply saying, Peter, before the night's over, you will have denied me three times. But on a whole other level, a more symbolic level, the cock crowing was announcing like an alarm clock, a wake-up call. This would be Peter's wake-up call to what? To seeing himself, to who he truly was, 
and where he fell so far short in his relationship is discipleship with Jesus. This cock crowing would be a rude awakening to a Peter who was fallen asleep to something deep inside himself, the very spirit of the Lord. Because for us, this is what truly must happen, especially this Holy Week. We must sound the wake-up call across this country to wake up to the things we have fallen asleep to, that is, become unconscious of, which is our very sinfulness. We don't even see it anymore. We're not even aware, awake to it all. We've got to wake up. Amen? We have fallen asleep to what the Lord is saying and wanting to do in our lives. This is the rooster that must crow today. We switch the scene now from this prediction of Peter's denial into the garden. Immediately following this alarm that Jesus tries to sound in Peter's heart and mind and soul, but he doesn't get it, they move into the garden. Jesus goes to this place called Gethsemane. In Hebrew, the word is Gat Sha'em. Gat Sha'em in Hebrew means oil press. For it was in this garden where Jesus often went to pray. Jesus chose this spot often to go to retreat with his disciples. It's no surprise he would go here this night before he died to choose that place of prayer so that he could gather the spirit that would strengthen him to undergo the cross that was before him. Jesus, this night, will be crushed by the forces of evil that were upon him. And from that night would come forth the light of the Lord's love that would shine for all ages to come. In all probability, what Jesus endured that night was a total breakdown. Imagine again that oil press. He was crushed mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I suspect that that kind of terrible brokenness was felt even more agonizing way, an excruciating way, even more than the physical pain he was to endure, was the emotional abandonment he felt from God, Remember, God, where are you? He was praying to God that he would hear his prayer, but no, God seems so distant. And yet, even if that isn't bad enough, but he called forth his friends. Why did he ask his disciples to be with him? Because he needed them in that dark hour when he was filled with doubt and worry and the pressure that was falling upon him, like us, human in every way but sin, needed the support of his friends. He could see him gathering and inviting his closest disciples and friends, Peter and James and John, as he said to them, My heart is nearly broken with sorrow. Remain here and stay awake with me. I'd like to highlight those words. Stay awake with me. This will be the very last request that Jesus asked of his disciples then and here and now today. So we need to know what does it mean to stay awake with the Lord. I would say we can tell what stay awake means if we look to Jesus and we can see what to fall asleep means if we look to Peter and the disciples. So we look to Jesus to find first, what does it mean to stay awake? Of course, it means so much more than just staying awake physically. It means more so spiritually. But what does that mean? To be awake and aware of what? Of God's presence and God's will and God's working and God's response and God's strength and God's grace that's always present to us who are present to the Lord. So Jesus falls prostrate. There's such a, a powerful message here in the very posture prayer that Jesus takes. He falls prostrate. You see how he's given totally to surrendering his life over to the Father. He says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I hear Jesus crying that out, don't you? 
So what is Jesus awake and aware of? His own feelings. And he's not afraid to pray out of that fear that he feels. That's how we need to pray. And yet, he's also awake to the fact that he's not living his own life with his Father's will. He's only here to accomplish the Father's will. So he says, but let it be as you would have it, not I. There is a man, Jesus, who is totally aware of God's will and living out that mission he had been given. The scene immediately flashes now back to the disciples. Remember Jesus' last request, his only request, stay awake. And what does he do? He finds them asleep. And he says to Peter specifically, Peter, so you could not stay awake for even an hour? Now think of that hour being the hour of darkness, the hour of suffering. The hour is that significant moment where we experience this call of Christ to be alive, awake to what he's asking of us. Jesus is calling him to a vigil of prayer, even more to a prayerful vigilance, you see. But the disciples are not aware and awake to Jesus' agony or to their responsibility to be attentive and supportive to their Lord. Gosh, how I often think of this scene when I sit in my office to listen to people's pain and problems and and hear how their closest spouse or friends or children or parents aren't at all aware what's going on. And, and I say, wow, how many of us are still today sleepwalking with our own families, among our own friends, because we're not really awake to what's going on deep inside of ourselves and in each other. Jesus is enduring his suffering this day. When we sing, were you there, what is our response? Were you there when Jesus went through his agony? We must say yes, because his agony is going on in the agony of the body of Christ today. If we don't see it, then we're asleep. So we need to wake up to the pain and the passion of Christ that's happening even as we speak today. Jesus says, again, stay awake and pray with me. And again, he withdraws and prays, my father, if it cannot pass without my drinking this cup, this cup representing what, think on terms of the mission he's been given, but even more symbolic is the cup that he had already offered at the Last Supper, that wine that would become his blood, that would become the sacrifice poured out on the cross, that's already being poured out, even in the garden. And then again he returns. Again, you have this stark contrast with Jesus, who's so intensely awake and aware of God's will, to the disciples, where he again finds them asleep. They could not keep their eyes open. What couldn't they keep open? They couldn't keep their heart open, their mind open, their spirit open. Just like we have a hard time opening our eyes to the real suffering going on around us. Again, Jesus calls them to stay awake. He returns to pray a third time and then returns again to the disciples and says, well, sleep on now. What a sad commentary that the disciples who were trained all these years to learn how to be with Jesus could not really be with him in the hour of greatest need. And so finally Jesus says, all right, get up. But he's feed his final wake-up call. Get up, you guys. Let us be on our way. Behold, our betrayer is at hand. Take notice here that three times the disciples were asked by Jesus to stay awake. Three times they were unable to be faithful to his request. And three times they hit, if you will, the proverbial snooze button to the alarm just as three times now we will hear Peter again denying Jesus. But see where this denial actually began, way back. Just as this denial spiritually happens first inside ourselves, you could almost see that this would be 
inevitable, almost predictable, what was going to happen because it was happening deep inside them already. So we shift then to Peter's denial as Jesus was then abducted by the soldiers out of the garden, taken across the Kidron Valley to the place called Caiaphas, the high priest's house, where prisoners were often taken and held hostage. Peter follows him, but we're told he followed him at a distance. Again, I'd like to highlight that. At a distance, Peter was one who truly tried to be a follower of Jesus. And yet, we see him following him still at a distance. Trying to follow through on his promise to be faithful even to death. You have to hand it to Peter, at least he tried. Where are the other disciples? They're not even coming close. Now again, we can identify with Peter as we try to see, and how do we try to follow Jesus? I often think that Jesus has lots of fans and many friends, but few followers. Lots of fans, many friends, but few followers who follow him all the way, all the way to laying their life down, all the way to the, where the gospel challenges us and calls us to sacrifice ourselves. We like to keep a safe distance. Many of us even try not to get too close to other people. Isn't that true in life? Because we're afraid of what love would demand of us if we got too close. And many of us even keep a certain distance from our own feelings, from our own families, because of the ways that can cause to task and terms in, in ways we're not prepared to respond. So you see Peter at a distance from Jesus, but nevertheless, give it to Peter. Give him this much. He's trying. And yet, in this courtyard, we see Peter, who's approached by one of the servant girls, and they say, you were with Jesus, the Galilean. Now remember, to be a disciple is to be one with. And Peter says in front of everybody, and that's an important point, in front of everybody, he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Again, we see the stark comparison between Jesus' heroic courage to be the Son of God, and for which he will be crucified, his heroic courage compared to Peter's horrific cowardice that says, I, I don't know him. No. Another servant girl approaches Peter. First we see Peter in the courtyard, and next time we see him at the gate. So what's happening here? Because the third time we're going to see him running out. There's this movement from being at least a little close to Christ, but moving further and further away. And so Peter at the gate moving further away, is approached again. And this time, he swears under an oath, I don't know the man. The point is powerfully understood that Jesus taught you should never swear under any oath. He's calling down God to be his witness. Isn't this odd? That he would swear at that moment the worst kind of perjury against his own friend, his own master, and yet you see, what is Peter denying? He's not only denying Jesus. He's denying who he is. He's denying everything that meant anything to him, Jesus Christ. And so a third person comes up to him and says, I know you are one of his followers. And Peter says in the most uncertain terms, I don't even know the man. What I read and researched and discovered is that very phrase, I don't know the man, is a Semitic expression, and the implication to know means I don't have anything to do with him. He means nothing to me. To know means to have intimate relationship. Don't know means no connection, no commitment, no concern at all. Imagine Peter saying that when, as I say, he's denying everything about who he is and who he said he was. Don't we do this sometimes? When our actions betray our very words and we, in effect, deny the fact we're Christian, which means to be given to love. 
to be faithful as friends and to be true as family. And at that moment, when Peter just washes his hands completely of Jesus, as Pilate will later do as well, cock crows, and here is the alarm that loudly goes off in Peter's mind. This is Peter's rude awakening. In this moment, he is totally awake and aware to what has happened, to what he has done. Now he knows his own sinfulness, his own weakness, his own humanness, something Jesus had always known, had always seen, had always accepted, but Peter never could. Now Peter breaks down. But what breaks down? That super ego that I say had to die along with Jesus at that place. And paradoxically, this death of Peter in his denial would become the greatest occasion of his own resurrection, his own transformation, his own conversion. Peter will be a new man later when he is open to receive Jesus' forgiveness. May we never give up this hope that there is no sin greater than God's forgiveness and mercy. Nothing we could do could ever keep us from experiencing Jesus' unconditional love. Nothing. Our sins are like a grain of sand dropped in the ocean of his mercy. Nothing should stop us. No matter how horrible our past or our sins, nothing should keep us. Nothing from becoming a greater saint because of it. This is what made Peter the great saint he was. The fact he realized what a great sinner he was. This is the rebound effect of God's great redemption. I invite us to enter into this Holy Week with this Holy Spirit of prayer. And like Peter, let us wake up to what the Lord is doing and offering and bringing to new life in us. Amen. Heart to Heart welcomes you back next week for another inspiring edition of Good News Today. If you are interested in other books, CDs, DVDs, or digital downloads by Father Jim or Father Michael, you can call toll-free 1-877-208-4875 or visit our website, www.heartoheart.org. There, you can also sign up to receive a weekly reminder to listen to these same programs online. And please, consider a donation of any size to help support Heart to Heart's radio and internet ministry. That's www.heartoheart.org or call 1-877-208-4875. Thank you for listening and may God bless your heart and the hearts of all of your loved ones. Heart to Heart